Go ahead, Carrie. Hi there, and welcome to our live stream today. We are lucky enough to have two members of the Plant-Based Cities Movement with us. We have Eleanor Carrera and Mo Markham, who are both co-founders and organizers of the Plant-Based Cities Movement. A little bit of background. Mo Markham has been active in climate-related initiatives for a long time. Uh, she actually went vacant about seven or eight years ago um, when she was living in British Columbia, and she really saw the effects of climate change in Western Canada. So it meant that she had to do some um, something on her own that she felt would really work, and that was going plant-based. She also is involved in the Waterloo Region Climate Initiatives, uh, the Eating Animals Causes Pandemics campaign, and she actually organizes her own local veg fest in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. Eleanor Carrera is a longtime committed animal rights activist, and uh, she actually has her BSc from McGill University in biology and ecology. She uh, focuses on transitioning institutions to a plant-based food system and is currently also working with a number of universities in Eastern Canada on doing that. She's also do, does outreach and policy lead work for Nation Rising. Uh, both, both Eleanor and Mo have dedicated a lot of their life and passion towards helping our climate and working on plant-based initiatives to take us there. Thank you to you both for being here today and over to Eleanor. Well, thank you very much for, for that great uh, introduction, uh, Carrie. Uh, very pleased to uh, be here uh, with uh, yourself, Bo, and the uh, team. Um, do we, are we starting the presentation now or? Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, so do you see the screen? Yes, yes I do. Okay, great. So uh, we're here uh, from the plant-based cities uh, movement. Mo and I are uh, representing the uh, larger team. The United Nations uh, last year declared a code red for humanity. In response to that, our ask is that the city councils take a stand and shift 50% of animal-based food purchases to plant-based purchases by the end of this year. In the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, the working group three, it was quoted that the reduction of excess meat consumption is amongst the most effective measures to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions with a high potential for environment, health, food security, biodiversity, and animal welfare co-benefits. So the world has already started to take action here in Canada, 644 Canadian municipalities have declared a climate emergency and thousands more across the world. And of those 644, I learned today, 525 are actually here in Quebec. I'm located in uh, Montreal. Uh, Montreal recently joined Toronto and 13 other cities across the world in committing to the C40 Good Food Cities Declaration. And last year, Vancouver voted to switch 20% of its animal-based purchases to plant-based in 2021. And uh, based on the VHS uh, study, that potentially could result in a savings of almost $100,000 and 500, 500 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And many universities and municipalities across the world are transitioning to plant-based meals. So we have good news on the Montreal front. On May 16th of this year, uh, the uh, council uh, passed a motion uh, which committed to the following, uh, amongst others, aligning its food procurement policies with the planetary health diet, offering a minimum of 75% vegetarian food at the events it organizes, supporting an overall increase in the consumption of plant-based foods on its territory, working with concessionaries who operate food service areas and who have contracts with the city to ensure that a greater portion of their offerings are plant-based and encouraging responsible food consumption among local, national and international uh, visitors. 
Other progress has been made as well in the following cities as a result of the PBCM presenting to council and environmental uh, committees. Last week, the Brampton City Council passed a motion to adopt a significant shift towards plant-based foods. As well, the Kitchener City Council Environmental Committee has agreed with our proposal in principle and has referred us to city staff sessions. The other uh, initiative that's going on uh, currently is the Pan-Canadian uh, University Initiative, which started in the fall of 2020. The goal of this initiative is to attain 60% plant-based meals by December 2022 at the university dining halls. Seven university dining teams have uh, presented, including uh, UBC, UVic, University of Toronto, University of Montreal, University of Guelph, McMaster University and Queen's University. We are going to have an alumni reunion of the seven teams who have already presented. Uh, that will happen on November the 9th and they will discuss their progress, their challenges and successes. We also have information regarding this initiative on this uh, link here. So I'll pass so, it to Mo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And so um, most of these are the slides that we are presenting um, to uh, city councils um, and to environment committees and to um, city councillors that we're working with. Um, but <coughs> some of them are just, uh, just for tonight. Uh, so the plant-based cities movement is also working with some other groups, um, one of them being uh, greener by default in the United States, um, also previously known as default veg. And uh, we're working with them on, um, as part of a coalition uh, that they're part of. And we may work towards a coalition, an international coalition, um, I guess beyond Canada and the United States down the road as well. Um, we're also working with the Veg Climate Network in Toronto and uh, with a UK uh, group that is doing similar work. So uh, we're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're making connections with other groups like Earth Save Canada to strengthen and expand our reach and our impact. And we are connecting with local climate groups for support when we go to council. Um, we've, we're working with the Ottawa Climate Save, Waterloo Region Climate Initiatives, Guelph Wellington Climate Initiatives, et cetera. Next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> it's important for us uh, to think about these things because for Canada, in particular, our carbon emissions, our cumulative carbon emissions per capita uh, since 1850 are actually higher than any other countries. Um, so we're higher than the United States and Australia, those are the second and third, and actually quite a bit higher than China, which is the second last one on this graph, although obviously not all of the countries are on here. Um, but, uh, you know, so as Canadians, we need to make change for sure. Um, next uh, slide, please, Eleanor. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are up, um, uh, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. And um, methane and nitrous oxide are particularly associated with animal agriculture and um, uh, heat the planet much uh, faster. So methane has about 56 times the global warming potential of CO2 over 20 years, and nitrous oxide 280 times the potential over 20 years. Next slide, please. Globally, over the last 50 years, the Earth's population has doubled. Uh, the Earth has warmed 0.8 um, degrees Celsius. Meat production is up 267%. Uh, per capita meat consumption is up 75%. And 17% more of the world's forests have been destroyed. Next slide. Uh, Plant-based versus animal-based foods. Um, <clears throat> Plant-based wins all the way. Uh, animal agriculture uses 83% of farmland, but provides only 18% of the calories we consume. This is from an Oxford study. Uh, the plant-based a plant-based food system can free up 75% of the land that we use for agriculture right now. And this is a huge opportunity for rewilding and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, sometimes people think regenerative grazing is a solution, but it actually requires more land, um, many times more land, um, sorry, at least twice the amount of land, so a lot more land than we would be using now, um, with industrial agriculture being most of the agriculture um, that we are seeing right now. 
and it and it results in more greenhouse gas emissions because the animals live longer and um, because it results in a great deal more deforestation and lack of reforestation. Next slide, please. And as you can see from this uh, graph, um, animal protein um, is much higher uh, than plant protein pretty much across the board. Um, this is true um, when we're looking at proteins. So um, if we compare them, um, animal protein always loses. Um, and this is also from an Oxford University study. Next uh, slide, please. And uh, this is from a University of Waterloo study um, and the, from the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation. So um, <clears throat> by mid-century, more than 17 million Canadians will live in uh, metropolitan areas that are experiencing extreme heat. Uh, so um, many of them are here in Southern Ontario. There's also uh, Montreal in there and um, others in Alberta and British Columbia are really gonna be hit as well. Uh, next slide. And some cities uh, like Windsor um, will experience almost 80 days every year of um, more than 30 degrees Celsius if we don't get our act together. So that's by mid-century. Um, that could happen. So the dark orange, that's the, that's, um, that's the worst case scenario. Um, and I think probably the best case scenario on, you know, is, is the uh, light orange. So, um, and this is also from the University of Waterloo uh, study. Next slide, please. Okay. So we, um, sorry, was this one yours, Eleanor? Yes. <laughs> okay, go for it. Okay, thank you, Mel. Okay, so I, I think everyone here must have experienced extreme weather uh, since uh, last year, uh, right across Canada, West Coast, all the way to East Coast, uh, different tragedies uh, happening, uh, uh, deaths, uh, this mass uh, muscle deaths in, in uh, BC, droughts, windstorms, uh, flooding, um, insurance costs in the order of over $2 billion as a result of uh, some of these extreme uh, weather events. And this is only the beginning. It's going to get much worse. Uh, just a little uh, piece on the nine tipping points. Uh, this is a sad situation because these nine tipping points, uh, once you cross that tipping point, they become uh, irreversible. And there are nine of them. I'll just show a few uh, pictures. So uh, the melting of the Arctic ice, the boreal forest fires, the Greenland ice sheets, it took 400,000 years for the Greenland ice sheets to form. So once they're destroyed, we won't see them again in several, uh, many, many uh, lifetimes. The uh, coral reef uh, die-offs, the deforestation of the Amazon, uh, again, primarily all due to animal agriculture, the East and West Antarctic ice loss, the thawing of the permafrost and the collapse of the Gulf Stream. These are major, major events. And again, the key point is they're, um, they're going to be irreversible. So we're gonna risk uh, food and water security. Shortages will increase, especially as our population grows by another uh, 2 billion. Accessing clean water is already a problem and it's going to get a much, uh, become a much bigger uh, problem. As you can see, the water requirements of animal agriculture are much higher than for plant-based uh, agriculture. The uh, global land use, only 29% uh, of the Earth's surface is actually land and 71% of that is habitable land. And of that habitable land, 50% is used for agriculture. Uh, now here the figure is 77, this graph has not been updated, this is our world in data, and the figure now is 83% is being used for animal agriculture, and that is producing only 18% of our calories. So it's a very, very inefficient system and very, very resource intensive. So this hypothetically uh, shows that as or if we move towards a vegan diet, we can reclaim about 3 billion hectares of land. And that land can be used for rewilding, reforestation. So this would be the, the best case scenario as more and more people go uh, vegan and to accelerate that transition. Okay, Mo? 
Thank you. Um, so uh, the Eat Lancet Planetary Health Diet and Canada's Food Guide uh, recommend that we increase plant-based plant -based foods for our health as well as for the planet. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Anna. Uh, so many of many issues, uh, many chronic diseases that we deal with um, can uh, be um, helped by a plant-based diet, uh, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Um, eating red and processed meat has been linked to cancer. Um, this is according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the, the World Health Organization, et cetera. Uh, Plant-based diets are associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, um, et cetera. Um, and this is actually um, one of the slides that we modified, um, which we do for individual cities. So this was for the city of Brampton, which is in Peel region. Uh, one in 10 uh, Peel adults has diabetes. By 2025, that number is likely to be one in six. This is according to a University of Toronto study. So, um, you know, when we present to council, we make sure to try to have um, references and information about the particular uh, city as well. Um, next slide, please, Eleanor. Um, <clears throat> there's also, of course, pandemics and zoonotic diseases. Uh, to deal with the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control, say three out of four diseases are zoonotic, which means they come to us from other animals. Uh, so this is uh, emerging diseases now. The occurrence of cross-species viral epidemics can be substantially reduced by shifting to a plant-based diet. So it's our animal agriculture system that is um, creating these pandemics. Uh, regardless of what animals people eat in different countries, it's, it's, um, you know, it can be uh, brought back to the eating of animals many times. Um, so, and uh, the WHO also says that we can expect far more serious epidemics and pandemics in the near future. And uh, no known epidemic has resulted for the transmission of a plant virus to an animal. Next uh, slide, please. Um, we also are dealing with antibiotic resistance. So the World Health Organization recognizes that the use of antibiotics in the livestock sector is one of the primary causes of antimicrobial resistance. Um, so uh, there's, this means that there's a declining uh, effectiveness of medicine to treat uh, bacterial infections. And this is one of the greatest threats to global health going forward. So the development of antibiotics was a miracle uh, for human beings, but it's a miracle that is, um, that, uh, is threatened by our food system again. So things like pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea, sem salmonellosis um, are becoming harder to treat and, and which means that more people are dying of them. Um, and uh, these lead to um, antibiotic resistant leads Antibiotic resistance uh, leads to uh, longer hospital stays and higher medical costs, and of course, increased mortality. Next slide, please. And uh, as you can see here, Canada um, uses a lot of uh, antibiotics in, uh, in, uh, in livestock. Um, next slide, and I think that might be yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mo. So definitely transitioning is a good business, no matter how you look at it. Uh, financially, the sales of plant-based groceries grew by more than 25% in uh, 2021 in uh, both USA and Canada. The plant-based uh, food market is worth about 600 million in Canada and uh, tenfold in the US. And more and more young Canadians are choosing plant-based uh, more often for the planet. And we definitely see that in the universities. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the city of Vancouver um, will hopefully benefit from a savings of almost $100,000 by shifting 20% uh, over to uh, plant-based from animal-based uh, purchases. So climate change will be very costly for Canadian municipalities, no matter which way you look at it. Cost of uh, illnesses uh, in uh, the US is uh, about $20 billion. Food security becomes a, a, ma a major uh, issue with um, uh, animal agriculture and plant-based replacements for each of the major uh, categories can produce a two to 20 fold more nutritionally similar food per unit of uh, cropland and definitely more sustainable. Mo? 
Sure. So thank you. Uh, so um, some of the ways that we're suggesting uh, to city councils that they transition. So some city councils have um, cafeterias um, uh, and in city hall. Um, many of them don't. Many smaller cities don't. And um, but they do often, um, you know, have conferences or events that they uh, provide food for. And so we're suggesting that they use the uh, greener by default principles, um, where they would default to the greener option, which would be plant based. So and and um, so essentially, if they if um, you know, right now, if you go to a conference or a workshop, or even if you're um, you're traveling, they might ask you, um, you know, to to um, choose your meal, right? And if the first meal that's offered that you know is offered to everyone is plant based, most people will end up going with that as the you know that would be the default. Most people would go with that. So it actually uh, kind of turns things around. Um, instead of, you know, and, and normally right now, um, those of us who are plant-based or vegetarian have to request a, a special meal, but this would be the other way around. So people who wanted to eat um, uh, meat or animal products would have to request them. Um, also, if, uh, you know, if it's at a cap cafeteria or a conference uh, line, the, the plant-based uh, foods would be featured first and um, Greener by Default has done research on this and this actually um, means that things, um, it changes the percentages um, of plant-based food. It increases the percentages of plant-based food, foods that are consumed. And we're also suggesting that um, if, if the city has concession stands at uh, sporting facilities, et cetera, that they swap out burgers and hot dogs uh, for plant-based um, alternatives, which would be a fairly easy switch. Um, next slide. So um, we have teams right now in, um, I think, 13 cities across Canada. We haven't approached uh, city council in all of those cities yet. We're kind of doing it in a strategic fashion, um, but um, we would love to have teams in uh, approaching every uh, city council in Canada. So if any of you are interested, we would love to hear from you. Um, we have prepared all the collateral. We have um, uh, including letters and presentations, uh, references, etc. And um, these are, of course, customizable by city and region. So um, that's our contact information there. Mine is uh, climatesave at yahoo.com. And um, Eleanor is eleanor.carrera at gmail.com. Um, we would uh, love it if you were interested in being involved or uh, creating a team in your in your city. And we can support you as well. So we've gone to some um, to city council and um, had teams uh, presenting together and some of the people were from that particular city and some weren't but they were part of the team um, and we weren't questioned on it so um, you know it isn't something that you have to do alone. Um, I think that's it unless you had any other um, uh, comments on it um, Eleanor? No, no, um, I have no comments, but we are certainly open to answering any uh, questions that uh, the audience may have. So I've stopped the sharing. So thanks, Donna. Thank you, Mo. No worries. Carrie, did you have any particular, um, did you want to? Uh... So thank you very much for that presentation. That was, that was really wonderful. And it gives me a lot of hope uh, in the fact that we're, branching out to different areas. We hear about things globally. We hear about some things nationwide and we hear a lot. I, I don't, personally don't feel like we're seeing a lot of enough traction, but at the city level, uh, that brings it more home, more personal. And I think that's a really good way for people to start thinking about it because they're involved in their city every day um, that they live their life, right? That yeah. Every living and day. And that's one of the reasons that we decided to um, to go um, with cities. Um, you know, at a local level, it's easier to make change. Yeah. And you know, when cities start stepping up and and um, uh, doing this, like when they declared a climate emergency and started looking at that issue more seriously, um, I think it will be a good message um, to send to the public. And it's just so much more possible on a local level. Like I know my city councilor. Um, I also know my member of parliament, but you know, um, it's, it's just much easier to know uh, people who are local and to talk at a local level and, and 
um, you know, we're hoping that making change at this level, you know, it'll start to rise, rise up this, to the top. This definitely fits in with, with um, Earth Saves, uh, how Earth Saves thinks. But I, I do want to ask you guys a question. I mean, the numbers when it comes to animal agriculture are, they're significant. And yet, getting a hold of that, getting, giving that some momentum from a global level, from a country level has been hard. Do you have any sort of idea or thought about why this part meets resistance? It's difficult uh, to change. Sorry, Eleanor, you go ahead. Okay, I, I think in general, humans don't like change, right? And humans like to make their own decisions and their own choices. And food is very often treated as a personal choice, right? It's, it's what you prefer. My view on that is it's a personal choice if it doesn't affect everybody else or the planet or whatever, then yes, it's your personal choice. But I think what people don't see is the far reaching impacts of animal agriculture, that it destroys everything. It's destroying our forests. It is destroying our animals. It is destroying our oceans. So that can no longer be viewed as a personal uh, choice. And what we have started to see pretty visibly is that the institutions such as the, uh, the cities and the universities now have become much more receptive to it. Had this been maybe even two years ago or three years ago, I don't think we would have seen even these three recent uh, successes that we've had within the, uh, uh, our, our movement. So I think there is starting to be a change I think we have to accelerate that change. Time is not on our side, as I showed with the uh, tipping points. We have to act very quickly. I think the next five years are really critical, like major changes. It, you know, we can start small, but we've got to really accelerate them and everybody has to do it. It can't just be the 3% or 5% that are vegans. It's, it's gotta be a critical mass of the population. And yeah. sorry, Mo, uh, yeah. I'll pass it back That's to okay. you. And yeah, and I think I think um, part of it is, you know, um, it's tradition, right? Um, it's, it's how people perceive it. But you know, in reality, um, we really never ate this much um, meat or animal pot products in the past. You know, um, it's only really this century that we have eaten in this way. And uh, as we're doing this, our population has doubled, right? So it's it's a massive change that we need to make. Um, and um, that's one of the reasons that, that we're doing this. This is what, what we do all the time. Um, we continue to try to, you know, move the needle. Um, and we've started in Canada. Um, and, um, you know, we started here hoping that others would um, take up the torch as well. And then we discovered that there were other groups doing similar um, actions in uh, the United States and in the United Kingdom, and for all we know elsewhere as well. And we would love to uh, find out about it if that is happening um, yeah. elsewhere. And we'd love to work with people and just help them. You know, we've, we've um, traded resources with both of these uh, other groups and we're, you know, working on this sort of coalition with the American groups uh, as well. And, you know, um, just to, to try to move that needle, um, I think it's important. So, and to help people to see um, how little time we have left to make significant change. So I have some questions from um, other people that have appeared on my chat. So first question, um, when were you founded? When did this start? The Black well, Cities yeah. Movement. We came up with the idea around the end of November uh, last year. And sort of the thinking behind it was, we've got all these universities across Canada, why don't we sort of replicate that model, but rather than with universities, we'll do it with cities and establish uh, teams in each of those cities. The, the idea was to do it across Canada. We need big hmm. impacts, we need everybody uh, to act. So yeah, it's been fairly recent. So this is, I think, what is surprising and uh, really uplifting is that we've had these three uh, successes fairly early on. And because the councils 
are much more receptive than we had, I think, originally uh, anticipated. And Mo, oh. I don't know if you agree with that, but I think yeah, that's- Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, and you know, we, we thought there would be more pushback, um, but so far, um, for the most part, um, councils um, and environmental committees have been agreeable to, to the idea. Um, yeah, so um, is, that, is this uh, started in 2022 or 2021 then? Uh, yeah. I guess officially in 2022. Um, oh, wow. I okay. Think, yeah. That's, that's very impressive for an organization that started so, so we determined. We're determined <laughs> to carry and yep. to keep going. <laughs> so when, how do people, when they, when they start to get interested in doing this and they want to see some change in their cities, how do they get to council? Like what? You know, well, I think are baffled on how to start. For sure, and, um, we can always support people um, in in that. Um, and usually, the first thing to do is to find out if there is um, uh, a city councilor who is, um, you know, plant based or open to the idea. Um, and sometimes you can find things um, online uh, around this, or just you know asking around. Um, but also. Um, targeting city councillors who are um, uh, who are uh, interested in climate issues um, to begin with, um, and um, you know then um, you know um, you can make a delegation. You can make a delegation to the environment committee or to the city council in your city um, by simply filling out forms that are normally online, and you tell them you know the date that you would like to speak to them, etc. It's always good to have a counselor on your side um, and you know to to kind of work with them beforehand um, because when it goes to city council then you know you have that support right yeah if i can uh, maybe add to that uh, i think uh, mo uh, you're right if you target the counselor responsible for the environmental portfolio they're obviously more sensitized uh to the issues and you probably will have more luck but I, I think the first rule is just do something. We have the collateral, we have some expertise, so we can meet with anybody and go through the, the different steps, go through the collateral, what they should say, what they shouldn't say to kind of test the, the waters. And surprisingly for Montreal, I had the opportunity, I had been invited to speak to the opposition party initially, but they don't have the, the balance of, of power or anything. So. Uh, I needed to go to the ruling uh, party. So of course, started writing those emails. I put together presentations, sent it to the counselor for the environment. And then I think it was about two or three weeks later, I received a call from one of the counselors in the executive council of the city. I was very surprised. I said, she, I guess, had talked to, to the other counselor and reached out. So you can see that there is this interest and this willingness to do something. I think everybody now can see the writing on the wall. Can you define a little bit more by what you mean by collateral? Well, collateral, so collateral? is all the resources that, that we have, whether it's uh, generally it's, it's the letters, the presentations, uh, we don't have videos yet or anything, but all the aspects of the communications campaign that we would use with, we would use with uh, city council. So and, almost like templates that a person can work yes. from and, and, yes. and uh, right. change according to where Exactly. Okay. And we and have also, a, a database too, a, a resource of many studies and so on that some references can and, yeah. to go through and, you know. Learn. And also, uh, you know, uh, most things are being done on Zoom at the moment. And um, that's kind of our friend right now um, because uh, we can, you know, help each other uh, from different provinces and attend yeah. a meeting with a city councilor um, uh, and, and or with uh, the environmental committee or, or whatever, so um, you know, so so the support is there. Um, we're happy to do that. That's that's wonderful because I think a lot of people are, are a little bit nervous approaching council the first time, um, and they need to have a little bit of support to do that. I also like the aspect of trying to find a counselor that is uh, friendly to to uh, looking at doing extra things, going plant based for climate change, and I think there's more of them out there than we realize right now. So sure. it's good for people to look into that. Now, um, I know that you're focused, uh, your group is focused on cities. Um, 
And you're not looking at provincial at all then? Not at this time, I don't think. Well, uh, I would say with us in, in Quebec here, it's a little bit uh, different because we are uh, having a provincial election uh, this fall. Oh, and yes, of course. So uh, being in the Coalition for a Sustainable Food Transition, they are approaching the candidates to find what their stance is, their position is with respect to moving towards a plant-based uh, food system. So that is currently uh, in, in the works. Okay. Okay. That, that's a, that's uh, a side yeah, gig no, for I'm Eleanor, in. though. That's a Sorry? side gig for Eleanor. I said that's a side <laughs> gig for Eleanor, though. Um, the the plant-based cities movement, we're just focused on cities right now. But, you know, at some point we will rule the world. So. Oh, OK, good. Uh, it's good to know what's in the strategic plan. All right. Um, so cities, when you're talking about the cities, you're talking about some cafeterias, if they potentially have them. You're talking food events. Where do schools and hospitals fit in within the cities, are they part of the cities? How, how does that work? In, in Canada, um, schools and hospitals are both provincial, um, but uh, there are some, uh, so the, um, what's the Toronto group called? Uh, Veg Climate Network, I yes. always get it wrong. Um, I, I always forget which word comes first, but uh, the Veg Climate Network in Toronto, I think is also doing some work with schools, but um, here, um, those those things are provincial, so they aren't part of like the city's mandate. Um, but you know, if we are, um, you know, if we get enough cities on board, um, and we get some, um, you know, we get um, the uh, media attention down the road. Um, hopefully, you know, this will there will be a trickle down effect. Um, but some of the groups that we're working with, say in the United States, and and the folks we're talking to in the United Kingdom. Um, often schools and hospitals are municipal, so um, so they are working on these um, um, on you know on that um, level simultaneously. So, so sorry. Do you Eleanor. know? Do you know I could, come, oh, sorry, Eleanor. Yeah, for, for Montreal, it, it's a little bit uh, different because in that motion, uh, one of those um, one of those commitments was to spread it out to the uh, school boards, et cetera. Mm. Like they really want to take a full approach with respect to institutions, uh, even further out than their own uh, municipality uh, itself. Okay. So yeah, that's what we're hoping for. No, that's great. I think that's, a, that's an excellent step. If they can do that, that's wonderful. Um, uh, Jen was asking about how many cities we've uh, the, the group has presented to so far, and I guess how many cities right now do we uh, does the group have as um, uh, participated? Do you know that offhand? So I think we have thirteen um, teams in thirteen cities. We have not gone to council um, in all of them. I think um, we've talked to councillors and sort of started the process in four of them. One of the things that we started talking about. Um, was uh, you know thinking about it strategically, like cities that we thought um, cities that a you know may have had such a, a suggestion before um, and turned it down, um, you know to to uh, kind of do them later in the process mm -hmm. um, because uh, like with the climate emergency, it was almost like a domino thing, you know, like once one city did it, more and more cities did. So, and I'm sorry, Eleanor, I. I you ask me a question, I answer it, but I should yeah, give that's you okay. an opportunity to do it as well. Yeah, but also, uh, you know, with the C40 uh, cities, this has sort of brought a lot of attention uh, to uh, cities. So I, I think that's been uh, useful. And uh, I forgot to mention, I think, that our Mayor Valerie uh, Plant is a vice chair for the uh, C40 uh, steering committee. And their next meeting is October 19th to uh, 21st. So, so I'm going to ask you to explain C40, just in case somebody out there hasn't heard about that. Okay. Well, I think in terms of C40 cities, it, basically that they follow uh, the planetary health diet guidelines, that they're committed to uh, all the aspects of uh, working towards improving the uh, climate crisis, reducing the greenhouse gases, et cetera. Then uh, a subset of those are those who have signed the Good Food Cities uh, Declaration. So up till now, it was 14, and Toronto was the only uh, city in, in Canada who had signed it. And now Montreal will be the uh, second city. 
Well, I definitely believe that you have a very progressive mayor in Montreal with Valérie, Valérie Plante. She's quite impressive. And I'm really excited to hear that we have two cities in Canada. Just the point that we don't have more, but that are part of the Good Food Initiative. I, um, that's pretty amazing. So um, right now, I, I noticed that you are asking uh, for about a 50% um, shift. 50% transition. Is that something that's hard and fast? Uh, there's various cities, um, will they all want to go 50? Do you think some would want to go more? Should we be asking for more? Where, where does the 50 come from and how does that number get adjusted? Can we make it higher? Eleanor, go for it. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a subjective number to a certain extent. You know, we, we had the case of Vancouver at uh, 20 percent. Uh, initially, well, my ask was that it would be 50 percent this year and 100 percent next year. In addition to that, I had asked for divestment uh, from uh, companies involved in animal agriculture, for example, okay. in the uh, pension uh, portfolio. Um, but that was not part of, of that uh, motion. So yeah, it is, it is definitely a subjective number. It has to be obviously attainable, right? We can't ask for 100% right up front. It's just not going to happen. So I think we have to be uh, realistic. And I think 50% is uh, doable. Uh, it's pretty mainstream now, plant-based. And of course, with all the other alt proteins, you know, they could simulate uh, burgers and, and so on. Uh, they could go with 50-50 like universities, uh, University of Victoria, University of uh, BC, 50-50 uh, burgers, 50% uh, uh, meat, 50% uh, pea protein. So uh, yeah, 50% is a subjective and attainable number. And I think Mo, uh, maybe you'd want to add uh, to that. Sure. And I was just going to say, um, Vancouver did 20%. That was passed unanimously, but that was last year. And um, since then, um, you know, uh, the last two um, reports uh, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to the United Nations have been even more dire. Um, and, you know, they keep telling us we need to make change, we need to make change now. And both of them have talked about um, increasing plant-based. Um, and so we feel like at least 50%, um, and I hope that we're actually presenting it in that way, asking for at least 50% change by the end of this year. Um, and then, you know, next year we'll, we will uh, keep plugging away. Um, but, you know, it was a place to start. Um, for some cities, they may not feel like, you know, 50% is, is doable in their city, but, um, uh, you know, each team uh, makes their own choice as to what exactly their um, request is of city council. So, so do we said, um, sorry, uh, Carrie, that it doesn't end there. Like, it's not just 50% and then we go away. You know, it's going to be- We're not going away. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it doesn't stop there. So uh, Vancouver went, uh, agreed to 20% shift of their animal, uh, animal based animal based foods to plant based. Do we know how successful they've been and what's happened since they made that commitment? I think they're still working on it. Um, I think they they made the commitment in the fall and they're still working on operationalizing it. So, and one of the things that we're doing, like as we speak to council and, um, uh, uh, you know, environment committees, et cetera, is telling them that we would love to work with their staff because it's the staff, you know, city councillors make, make decisions and they, you know, pass um, uh, motions, et cetera, but it's the staff that actually have to operationalize it. And so we would like to also work with them and help them so that it is a success. So I know uh, it, um, the, the Vancouver motion uh, from last year was introduced from uh, the Vancouver Humane Society. And I know that they're still working with staff um, to, you know, try and work that out, so. Okay. Now, when people have presented, are, are you aware of any concerns that have come up at uh, presentations? Has uh, what kind of comments come up from the counselors? Any positive ones, any negative ones? So far, every, um, it's been positive uh, in Kitchener. It was, uh, you know, there weren't any negative um, uh, comments um, in Kitchener or in Brampton. Um, 
but I don't know if, if you wanted to speak to that as well, uh, Carrie, if, if you're comfortable with that, or uh, Eleanor, if you had any other uh, comments or? Well, I, I have to say Montreal, uh, again, has been very positive. Again, they reached out to, to me and uh, the counselor kept saying that the presentation was very interesting for her. So yeah, it's literally only been uh, very positive. So we're, we're really, really happy about that. Okay, so we'll, since you opened it up, Mo, um, I, I will speak to that. Um, so uh, for people that are that are watching, I have been part of the plant-based cities movement, even though I'm uh, moderating today as part of Earth Save. And I approached the district of North Vancouver. Um, there was a counselor there that was also very uh, supportive of the motion and um, or very supportive of the concept and put forward a motion for a 20% shift of the animal-based foods to plant-based. But unfortunately in the council, as it was set up there, uh, the vote did not go through. It was a four to three vote and um, against. And uh, there was a concern that this was um, sadly impacting on people's freedom. And, and all that was requested was a study. It wasn't even requested that the shift be made, just a study and putting staff, assi assigning staff to what it would mean to do that. So um, there are municipal council meetings happening across British Columbia uh, in October of this year. We'll have definitely different council members. Uh, the council member that was positive and put forward the motion will be um, running again and hopefully we'll be in council again. And you know, it's a new time to try. So I'll be going right. forward one more time. <laughs> and, and yeah, so there are elections happening in many municipalities yes. in the fall across Canada. And so I'm not sure if it's all municipalities, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. And so, um, you know, and many of them are actually breaking over the summer. So yes. in the fall, it will be, you know, new people. But honestly, you know, four to three, you know, isn't that bad. You know, these days, that's almost half. Um, and, you know, um, I think, as Eleanor was saying earlier, you know, two years ago, uh, it would have been very different, you know, and I think most of them understand um, that this is a necessary shift. But also right now, we're not asking for, for 100%. We're asking for a shift of 50% and using principles such as greener by default, where people still can choose um, to eat animal products um, if, if uh, you know, um, if they want to. Yeah. Um, and so it's really just, you know, moving things along. And one of the things that we talk about in our, you know, our letter that we send off to um, councils to begin with is just, you know, that this is kind of, um, you know, uh, plant-based foods are kind of, uh, um, you know, level the playing field really, um, because uh, people uh, from different, uh, religious um, uh, backgrounds um, can eat them um, and um, you know people who are vegetarian or vegan people who have uh, egg or dairy allergies um, so it's really you know everyone can eat plant-based foods right um, and so and the other shit the other way around it doesn't work so if you're planning um, an event this is an easy way of of um, of, of doing it, you know, of kind of um, making it accessible to everyone. And again, you know, councils, if they want to continue to offer um, animal products, they can do that as well and still be well within the 50% that we're asking, so. And if I can add uh, something to it, we've been lucky in the sense that the IPCC has released three reports in a very short period of time. The first report came out last August, that was the code red. Then we had the second report in February and the third report in April. So it's generating a lot more awareness. Uh, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres has issued some pretty terse statements, pretty dire statements, and that the window of opportunity to make changes is rapidly closing. So I think there's been a big shift and I can see it in the universities. I mean, we started in the fall of 2020 and there has been also a big shift of willingness to change, et cetera. So I think the last year itself has been, um, has changed a lot compared to two years ago. Okay. Yeah, that's very, very true. 
Very, very true. I have two more questions here. We're coming to the end of our hour. Um, so my next question is, um, some people are more comfortable with, you know, sending a letter, maybe not appearing in person. Does that help at all? Sending letters to council members, to city councils? Uh, Absolutely. You know, I, sorry, go ahead. And, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I never went to a city council, you know, I did it. The presentation helps, you know, uh, a letter with the presentation, et cetera. Oh. Everything uh, helps, right? And then, like I said, I was surprised when the councillor called me back. So I never presented at uh, city council. So yeah, definitely everything you do helps. The worst thing you can do is nothing. And, and the other part of it, you know, I'll just remind people that, um, you know, if even if they want to set up a, a meeting with their city councillor, um, you know, we'll be there. One of us can, can be there with them and, you know, uh, support them. Um, well, that's interesting um, because normally when I take a look at city councils, I think the people that are, um, that present should be part of city, that city. But how does that work? Do you sometimes have people that aren't necessarily part of that city, maybe an expert yes. on something? Um, yes, um, um, like what we did for um, Brampton City Council when we presented at Brampton City Council is we divided um, the slides. So y'all should know that when you go to city council, usually you get um, five minutes. Uh, some city councils, I think yours was three minutes. Uh, Carrie, you were allowed to speak for three minutes for a delegation. We were, yes, we were allowed to speak for three minutes. Yes. Yeah. So, so most city councils, it's five minutes. And um, so what we did was we divided the slide deck um, that we had today. We used most of those slides. We divided it into three sections. And um, so there was a young woman um, who's, who's uh, part of our group. Um, and uh, she actually presented um, in 2019 when they declared a climate emergency as well. She was a high school student at that point. Right now she's a university student. And so she presented um, on health and um, the economic impacts. Um, and um, uh, uh, I presented with uh, Dr. Tushar Mehta who is a Brampton resident and the two of us um, did another piece um, around environment, et cetera. And then uh, Dr. David Steele, um, who is a professor, um, uh, um, a re retired professor um, in British Columbia and also part of Earth Save, he presented with uh, Diane uh, Steele, who is Smeal, who is part of uh, Steele and Smeal. Um, they presented <laughs> um, a, a separate um, delegation. So we did three different delegations. On each delegation, there was a Brampton resident, um, um, but not not you know, not everyone who was presenting. We didn't get any flack about that at all. So, um, so normally it is somebody from, you know, it, it is somebody from the city presenting, um, but uh, you know, like I've also um, people, I know people who presented to the Waterloo council when they live in Kitchener. So I'm in, I'm in Kitchener. And so, you know, um, as long as you uh, live or have some relationship to the city, um, you might work there, have a business there, et cetera. Um, or one person in your delegation does so. Um, so it it uh, it wasn't an issue. That's a long answer. That's actually really excellent. I it's it's good to know that because then if you're if you want to bring someone in that's an expert like you brought in David Steele, that's yeah. uh, that really really helps. So as we're closing off, uh, one more question: How do we stay in touch? How do people find out what the progress is? How what kind of information is out there for people to pay attention to plant based cities movement? Well, we, we do have a website. Um, I mean, we're still, it's a work in progress, right? I mean, we really don't have uh, funds or, or expertise, so we're working on it. This is uh, strictly uh, grassroots. Um, I think the best thing maybe is to email us and we can give you, um, well, because we didn't put the link for, for the website on here, but uh, yeah, we can give you the website, but it's uh, plantbasedcitiesofmovement.org and uh, you can see what we have uh, there. Um, additionally, we can uh, have chats, you know, one on one and just to kind of find out, you know, do you know your city council? What do you think would be the reaction? We can give you tips. I mean, we want this to explode across Canada, right? So we're willing to do anything to help people out. So if you can just uh, contact us, we 
we'll help you in any which way we can. If we don't have anybody uh, local, obviously, you know, we, we can uh, just do it online. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much. This has been a lot of great information. It gives me a lot of hope that um, we can take the issue of being of um, helping our climate by our plant-based eating to different levels. And I do think that communication and leadership at a city level is really important to help individuals make different choices. Leadership is an important thing at every level. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Carrie, for having us and, and to EarthSafe for all, all that they do. Yeah, thank you, we'll see more. thank you, uh, EarthSave. I uh, really appreciate uh, this opportunity. And we really just want to encourage everybody in the audience to contact us and to uh, do something because eventually we will get to success uh, in your city. So please do contact us. Thank you very much and, for being uh, here. Right. I've just put the um, plantbasedcitiesmovement.org link on the chat. If anybody wants to go in there and pick it up from there, you can grab that. And yes, let's make this happen. Thank you so much, yep. Eleanor. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you for the work that you're mm -hmm. doing and for bringing this amazing organization to Canada and to EarthSave. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you.